This is the US Navy's controversial Zumwalt destroyer. The project has quickly become too expensive for the Navy to justify in front of Congress because it's already crossed more than $22 billion by 2008. As a result, the Department of the Navy stated that they didn't even want the Zumwalt anymore. She was supposed to be the US Navy's destroyer of the future. Instead, she was canceled after only three ships were built out of the Plan 32. But fear not, the Zumwalt might get the last laugh because in 2023, it'll become the first US Navy ship to install new hypersonic missiles. The Zumwalt class had a rocky history right from the start though, and its development story is honestly just a crazy up and down roller coaster ride. The project had multiple shifts in design goals and operational philosophy over the course of its development. The three remaining ships have been in a state of limbo with no real mission capability or purpose. It's like the sad anon of the Navy. That's why I have a soft spot in my heart for the Zoom wall, because I too know what it's like to be rejected and underappreciated. Can the Navy still salvage the Zoom wall concept? Before that, I want to take a second to tell you about this video sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, and make sure to stick around because at the end, I'll be sharing some cool bonus options offered through our custom QR code. Raid Shadow Legends is a sick mobile role-playing game with super in-depth battle scenes, amazing graphics, and it's completely free to play. And now, they offer more champion characters than ever. With over 800 completely unique, customizable champions, and mythical champion characters. That's basically two champions in one that can change between forms and unique metamorph skills. And with Halloween just around the corner, there'll be treats and tricks for those who are brave enough to go into the raid yard. Just download Raid Shadow Legends using the link below, copy your in-game player ID, and then venture over to raidyard.polarium.com before November 10th for the chance to dig up some amazing in-game items and even real-life prizes like Amazon gift cards worth up to $2,000. With all of this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? Use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get insane bonuses. Take a look at this vessel. All right, now look at this one. Can you tell the difference? One's a destroyer and the other's a cruiser. For those of us dumb enough to ask stupid questions, how can you tell the difference between the two? It's a little more complicated than distinguishing, say, a tank from an anti-air launcher, because ships carry all kinds of different capabilities. A good rule of thumb, though, is that destroyers are usually larger and more heavily armed than frigates or corvettes, but they're smaller and faster moving than cruiser classes. There aren't exact, specific guidelines to classify warships. They are instead usually put into categories based on their capabilities and how they were designed to engage a specific type of enemy. Destroyers like the Zumwalt are in the middle of the spectrum, which is exactly what my doctor told me I am. The Zumwalt is big enough to be classified as a cruiser in the old days, but its capabilities might be why the US Navy classifies it as a destroyer today. The warship provides multi-mission offensive and defensive capabilities, perfect for defending valuable aircraft carriers inside of carrier strike groups, for instance. The Zumwalt can first trace its roots to an earlier program from 1994 titled Surface Combatant for the 21st Century, or SC-21 for short. The SC-21 was created out of a concern that the US Navy lacked adequate naval gunfire support for amphibious operations and coastal battles. The reason the Navy was worried about this is because they were retiring the Iowa-class battleships at the end of the Cold War. The Iowa had a massive 16-inch gun battery and conducted shore bombardment in every major US conflict since World War II, and firepower like that is hard to give up. This concern was actually so great that the US Congress actually mandated or forced the US Navy to keep those old battleships in the Naval Vessel Registry as part of the reserve fleet until 2006, just in case they needed to be brought out of retirement to provide naval gun support while their replacements, like the Zumwalt, were being designed and built. So the focus of the SC-21 program was already controversial because it focused on naval gunfire support capabilities. On one side of the argument, officers in the Navy and Marine Corps said that naval guns are a backup weapon in modern combat and that a combination of missiles and aircraft can provide even more effective shore support than those old naval guns during coastal and amphibious operations. On the other hand, you had your more conservative naval officers that claimed that aircraft were too easily suppressed by the enemy 
and missiles are too expensive to offer widespread support to ground troops. It's kind of scary to think how much is at stake over these hypothetical arguments between officers in the Navy who are arguing about what would potentially happen in a future conflict while neither side has any real hard evidence. I like to call these two arguments the big guns versus the more missiles disagreement. But there's actually evidence and logic that we can apply to the situation to figure out who might be right. Because when we look at it, each cruise missile, each Tomahawk cruise missile costs about $2 million. That means there's a risk that Navy ships might run out of missiles or have to focus only on the most important targets if a near-peer conflict kicked off. Meanwhile, naval guns have shorter ranges than missiles and aircraft, but once in position, they can rain down shells much faster and more sustainably in a protracted bombardment campaign. There's these pros and cons. On paper, it looked like sticking to the big guns would be a cost-effective, reliable solution for the new destroyer instead of missiles. The SC-21 program came up with three main ship concepts, and they chose to go ahead with concept 3B1. It would have 9,400 tons of displacement with two 5-inch main guns and 64 vertical launch system cells for missiles. This would be the start of what would become the Zumwalt class. However, Chief of Naval Operations Michael Bodar canceled the SC-21 program in early 1996 in favor of a way bigger, massive 30,000-ton missile boat packed with an incredible 512 missile cells. CNL Bodar was a big believer in missile power, and he backed up this philosophy with a 1993 RAND Corporation study that found an enemy naval invasion could be instantly stopped with a massive wave of precision-guided missiles, knocking out at least 20% of the invasion force, a feat that neither aircraft or gun-armed ships could accomplish in such a short time without great risk. Okay, so we're getting away from the big guns theory and going with the more missiles instead. All right, kind of got whiplash, but I can get on board with this. Let's do it. The missile-armed ship concept Bodar championed was termed the Arsenal Ship and went directly into prototyping stage through a special budgetary authority under DARPA that allowed this design proposal, the, the, the pet project of the Admiral, to bypass a lot of bureaucratic red tape and have a functional prototype ready to go by the year 2000. The Arsenal ship was a major departure from the gun-based shore bombardment priority that the Navy thought they needed. But the Navy viewed the concept as a high priority to come online quickly to counter a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So keep in mind, at this point, we're retiring a bunch of old bombardment vessels and we're going to replace it with a missile one instead. It's, it's a risky move. Then CNL Bodar passed away on May 16, 1996, which meant the Navy's focus shifted yet again. Under new leadership, the Navy cut funding to the Arsenal ship and revitalized the gun-armed S-21 program from before as the DD-21, or Destroyer for the 21st Century. Under the DD-21 project, what would become the Zumwalt class started taking shape with the futuristic stealth hull and greater automation of ship systems to reduce crew requirements. These are main points of the Zumwalt. The main attraction of the destroyer was that the advanced design would have a high upfront cost, but the low crew requirements would reduce ongoing operational costs by 70% compared to conventional destroyers. But just in case you're finding this story too easy to follow and too straightforward, there's another redirect, another subversion of expectations. The program shifted from the DD-21 to the DDX in 2001, during the changeover from the Clinton to the Bush administration. The Zumwalt reached its final form as the DDG-1000 series. The US Navy placed an initial order of 32 destroyers to be built at Bath Iron Works in Maine, not Bed Bath & Beyond. The lead ship of the class, the USS Zumwalt, began construction in 2009 and launched in 2013. It had a renewed focus on land attack capabilities, and the Navy drafted up several options for the ship's main guns, including the possibility of fitting rail guns to the project. Instead, they opted for an upgraded conventional gun concept in the advanced gun system. Design
designed by BAE Systems, the AGS was going to be the new ship's special sauce, firing GPS-guided 155 shells with extreme accuracy out to a range of 63 nautical miles. Okay, so it looks like we're going back to the big guns theory. This is the ship's advanced gun system, 155 turret, designed for heavy shore bombardment. The Navy claimed the incredible accuracy of the AGS meant two guns could do the job of six. It would basically be like a floating artillery island. You could just park it off the shore. It had a capacity to carry 990 artillery shells. But normally these big cannon barrels are a big no-go for stealth radar because they jut out and create a big radar signature. However, the AGS barrels are hidden inside the stealthy angled structure. Then at the last minute, they pop out, rotate, and fire, along with 80 VLS launch cells the new destroyer would still have a respectable missile capability in addition to the advanced gun system. So they kind of split the difference and decided to go with both big guns theory and the more missiles. But in reality, the Zumwalt's guns have never been fired outside of prototype testing, not even for training exercises. The guns are in there, but they don't have any ammo to use. This led to a downright comical situation where the Zumwalt destroyers have been cruising around with fully functional empty guns for years, which were supposed to be the whole reason for the class in the first place. So why did this situation happen? What went wrong here? So Lockheed Martin and BAA Systems developed a long range land attack projectile. It used a rocket assisted projectile with steerable fins and GPS guidance to achieve an accuracy of 50 meters or less at a maximum range of somewhere between 68 and 115 miles. That's an insane distance for an artillery projectile. And the reason it can achieve that is because a ship can support a heavier, larger, and longer barrel than your ground artillery cannon. But there was a kind of catch-22 problem. The original cost for those shells, the long-range artillery shells, for the full series of 32 Zumwalt class destroyers would have been relatively small, $35,000 per shell. But when the Navy slashed the number of ships down to three, this projectile, the long range artillery shell, lost the benefit of economy of scale that mass production brings. The advanced shell quickly ballooned in price to almost $1 million per shell, completely negating the advantage of using a naval gun compared to a cruise missile. To make matters worse, the highly advanced ammunition of the AGS guns meant that they couldn't use any other type of regular old dusty 155 mm projectile, despite it being a common caliber throughout the US military. They just wouldn't fit in the AGS gun barrels or the specialized quick firing loading system. The quick loading system was revolutionary if it had gone fully operational. The Zumwalt would have been able to drop six high precision shells on a target within two seconds. But the existing ships aren't totally harmless. This is the Zumwalt's Mark 46 Mod 2 gun weapon system. It's a 30 mm autocannon that's designed to defend the Zumwalt against small, lightweight threats like speedboats and sea drones. The two guns are mounted on either side of the Zumwalt, and they have a similar fire control system and thermal camera to what your infantry fighting vehicle like the Bradley might have. They're meant to engage targets too small or low priority to warrant firing a missile off at. With the two main guns, the AGS without any ammo, the Mark 46 represents the only guns on the ship besides small arms. So it's a far cry from the gun-based fire support ship that designers had originally envisioned for the Zumwalt. But all is not lost thanks to the more missiles theory. The Zumwalts have 20 Mark 57 VLS launchers that have four cells each. What that means is that it has a total of 80 launch missile cells. All right, great. So sounds like we're back to the more missiles concept. I can switch back and forth all day. I can do this procurement flop forever. Each cell can launch up to four evolved Sea Sparrow missiles or one Tomahawk cruise missile. In 2020, the Navy confirmed that the Zumwalt could fire the SM-2 missile from its VLS launchers, giving it a long-range anti-air and anti-cruise missile defense capability, finally, for the first time. This is the Zumwalt class enormous hull during construction. It displaces 15,656 tons and has a length of 610 feet. Most modern destroyers are usually in the ballpark of 7 to 10,000 tons and a length of around 500 feet. The Zumwalt class is way bigger than most cruisers. All that extra weight and space 
goes into the stealthy design and advanced systems of the DDG 1000s. The best open source intelligence estimates believe that the Zumwalt has a radar cross section closer to a small fishing vessel around 25 feet in length. So you basically look like a tiny innocent fishing boat on a radar. The hull's shape is known as a wave piercing tumble home design, but what the heck does that really mean? It incorporates flat surfaces and enclosed sensor masts along with radar absorbing materials to keep that radar signature down. Basically everything is tucked away inside the hull like a similar to a, a stealth aircraft. The Zumwalt class can still reach a respectable 30 knots of speed and handle rough seas better than conventional hull shapes. 30 knots is about 34 miles per hour or 55 kilometers per hour for all of us folks who don't have our sea legs yet. The Zumwalt class also uses a new type of propulsion system called an integrated power system by the US Navy. So even if this thing gets scrapped and it's given to the Coast Guard and all the puddle pirates, it still was responsible for creating some new technology that might be useful in the future. I say puddle pirate as a term of endearment. The integrated power system is kind of like having a hybrid car versus a full gas powered vehicle. The IPS means power can be intelligently shifted between the ship's different systems like its turbines, props, weapons, and shipboard power. So when you hear Captain Picard say something like, uh, divert all power to the shields or 50% more power to the weapons, Skipper, you can do something like that with the Zumwalt. And it generates 78 megawatts of electricity. That sweet, sweet extra power makes it a good candidate for the Navy's railgun concepts and the hypersonic cruise missile if they can ever get out of the testing and prototyping stages. Look at the Zumwalt's radar tucked away all stealthy like. This was initially supposed to be dual band radars and sonars that could perform multiple types of searches at once while networking to other ships and aircraft in the fleet to share a whole data picture of the combat zone. It's Raytheon's SPY-3 or SPY-3 radar that has an unclassified range of 200 miles. Radar detection is an important part of what the Navy calls kill chains, quote unquote, because of the first step in the kill chain. This is an important concept to understand in modern naval and air warfare. A kill chain refers to a sequence of steps in order to first detect, then track, then engage, and ultimately destroy an enemy target. It's a nice, clean, systematic approach to destruction that anyone with OCD will really appreciate. The kill chain basically coordinates all the different sensors and weapon systems available to an entire fleet to defeat a specific kind of enemy threat. With the move to artificial intelligence, this is starting to be described as kill webs. So how do you stay on top of the kill chain? How do you, how do you become a, a kill chain apex predator? Take a look at the US X-band radars. This type of system is high enough resolution to track an object the size of a baseball over San Francisco from all the way in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia. That's a distance of over 2,900 miles. This should give you a hint as to why the most dangerous threats to the USS Zumwalt aren't coming from above the waves. Submarines, mines, and torpedoes. The nightmare of a destroyer. Luckily, the Zumwalt is lousy with underwater radars too, like the ANSQS-60 mounted to its hull. But to get back to why kill chains are so important, the Zumwalt class doesn't have torpedo tubes or depth charges of her own, so when it detects an enemy sub, it would coordinate with different frigates or corvettes in the fleet that have better anti-submarine capabilities. But this thing costs the same as a small country's GDP. So, so where is all the real innovations here? After reviewing all the weapons and systems that the Zumwalt has, just about the only thing the ship still has going for it is stealth capabilities. But the curse of the Zumwalt strikes again. While the shape and composite construction bring the ship's radar cross section down significantly, it still isn't enough to truly hide the ship. Enemy vessels can still track and hit something the size of a fishing vessel on their radar. So while the Zumo class won't immediately stand out as a warship, in the event of a full shooting war with a near-peer country, 
chances are it'll see a missile launched its way anyhow. As early as 2008, 15 different intelligence reports showed that the Zumwalt was vulnerable to new and emerging missile threats that its stealth capabilities could not evade. In a statement before Congress in January 2008, Chief of the Naval Operations Admiral Gary Ruffhead said, quote, the world has changed markedly since we began the march to DDG-1000 in the early 1990s. That year, the Navy canceled the DDG-1000 program, requesting only the two hulls currently in construction be finished. Congress decided to complete a third hull to preserve shipbuilding capacity at Bath Iron Works, but agreed that the remaining 29 vessels wouldn't be built. What had originally been hailed as a technology demonstrator that would shape naval designs of the 21st century was now a 90s has-been, forced to sail around without a purpose. The Navy instead diverted funds from the Zumwalt program to building more of the older, still capable Arleigh Burke destroyers. And yet this roller coaster has one last summit, one last mountain to climb. This destroyer still needs to do some destroying because in 2022, another announcement came just when we thought all hope had been lost, just when we thought the Zumwalt was down and out for the count. In 2022, the Zumwalt guns, turrets, loading mechanisms, and magazine spaces would be gutted and thrown out, then replaced with 12 conventional prompt strike hypersonic missile launch tubes. This would be the first US naval vessel to mount a hypersonic missile. The missiles use a two-stage design to maneuver at speeds of Mach 17 and hit targets at over 1,725 miles away. That's New York to Mexico in six minutes. That's London to Libya before you finish eating breakfast. That opens up new options to admirals to hit highly mobile targets or high value targets that are only open for a short period of time that are highly defended. The Zumwalt is the perfect fit for this capability because the enormous rocket boosters that they need to get the speed and altitude don't fit in conventional VLS cells and would take up too much deck space if mounted externally. The space currently occupied by the empty AGS guns gives just enough space for these huge missiles to fit comfortably. All of these design choices that were a massive failure in the past seem to have conspired to work perfectly for the hypersonic missile. What a beautiful cluster f This is what makes the Zumwalt so relatable and lovable. It continues to fail its way to success. The Zumwalt is like Inspector Gadget, just accidentally winning the day. To be fair, it's too early to tell exactly how the Zumwalt destroyers will evolve into the late 2020s. The installation of new hypersonic missiles could give them a new lease on life and finally live up to their potential. If the Zumwalt had actually been fully developed with all of its planned systems, it's doubtful it would have been a useful asset in the modern battle space, but the hypersonic missiles might make up for that. And the Navy wouldn't have anywhere near the number of new ships and weapons that it has now without this vessel. As new weapons and sensor systems come online, we may yet see the Zumwalt leading the way in testing and developing them with its advanced power and computer systems. Until then, the Zumwalt will only be as good as the new hypersonic missiles turn out to be. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, follow me on Instagram at CappyArmy. I'm your average infantryman. Check out one of these videos if you have a minute, and I'll see you guys again in a couple of days.